I love our acoustic days sometimes. It's just refreshing. It's just so great. Happy Mother's Day again. If you're watching online, we want to welcome you. So glad that you are tuned in. We know we have a whole lot of our family who are away for a few months up at their up there up north. And so uh, we want to say welcome to you guys and glad that you're staying connected with us and watching online. As Robert said, I know that Mother's Day can be both, you know, it can be a very, very special day. And I know it can be a very sad day and a hard day f- for many as well. And being a mom or a dad in this current culture right now can be a very scary thing. It can be. I mean, huge responsibilities. Uh, being a mother or a father isn't for the faint of heart. We know that. And it requires some tough decisions, decisions that are risky, that are uh, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching sometimes, decisions that require a lot of faith. Now, I know for me, uh, growing up, my dad and my uncles, my grandfather, my pastor, they all elevated and celebrated uh, women. And ladies, I was surrounded by solid men in my life that, you know, really set the example for treating women with great respect and honor. And I believe that's actually a very biblical model throughout the Bible, even in a culture where it was primarily male dominated, God elevated and he raised up women in status and prominence and the kingdom of God flourished because of women throughout scripture. But there's one woman that you may have never heard of uh, before, her name anyway, but she was a powerhouse in the kingdom of God. She is the mother of Moses. Anybody besides Pastor Phil, anybody know, (laughs) anybody who knows? knows the name of Moses' mother. Shout it out. Anybody? I see some Googling. Googling. Can't Google that. No Googling. So it's pronounced, it, it goes, it, it's pronounced Yaakoved. Yaakoved. You have to get a little bit of hucking in there. Yaakoved. Jokabed is the way you might see it on, on the scripture pages. Jokabed, but it's Yaakoved in the Hebrew. She was a very special lady. She raised three very type A, (laughs) very type A personality children, Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. But her role and her responsibility as a mother (laughs) would not be an easy road. She's actually only mentioned by name twice in the Bible, once in the book of Exodus in chapter 6 and once in Numbers in genealogy accounts. But she's also listed in the great chapter 11 of Hebrews, which we call the Hall of Faith, or I call it the Faith Hall of Fame. And she's not listed by name there, but we know who she is because of the genealogies. But she's listed in the Bible among the greats for our faith, along with her husband Amram. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right or not. And Yachavid, Yachavid. Can you say that with me? Yachavid. We wouldn't do that during COVID, right? Yaakovid. It says this, it was by faith, this is what it says in Hebrews 11, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born, and they saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Now, there was just something special about Moses that made Yaakovid realize that Moses was, in fact, unique, and he was special. In fact, The word that the scripture uses here is that he was fine. He was a fine specimen. He was beautiful and he was good. Now, I know that every mother thinks that about their child, right? I mean, we see these pictures that these mothers post online of their brand new, you know, infant babies that are just born. And then they'll say, you know, isn't he just perfect? Isn't he beautiful? And I just want to say, hey, we like to be transparent here at the church. (laughs) And honesty is important. But sometimes we're not completely honest because what we're thinking in our heads is like, no, he's not. (laughs) He looks like a lizard. (laughs) Looks like a lizard. I mean, we don't say it out loud, but how many times have you thought, oh my, you know, (laughs) I'm sure he'll grow out of it. And they usually do after a few days, most of them, you know. 
But there was a, there was a prompting by God with Yaakovid that there's something different about Moses. Now, let me give you a background. So if you're a Bible student here, and I hope that you are, and I want you to go back and read Exodus chapter 1 today, as I'm going to give you a brief history of Exodus chapter 1 that goes over about a 400-year period of time, okay? And so uh, the Israelites were, were facing a famine in their land, and under Joseph's leadership, and God really orchestrated this deal for Joseph to be in leadership in Egypt, uh, they, the Israelites migrated to Egypt where, they were, where there was plenty of food and work and they could survive. And really, they flourished for a long time. They had a good life. They had a good run for a, quite a while. This is all. You'll find all this in Exodus chapter 1. But as the years passed and as Joseph died... The, the Egyptian leaders forgot about the relationship with Joseph, the Israelite, and, and they just forgot about that. But at, along the, that line, the Israelites were continuing to grow, and they were growing in numbers big time. But soon after Joseph dies, he was the advocate for the Israelites that were living in exile in Egypt. And the Egyptians, after they forgot about Joseph, they forgot about that relationship as years and years went by, they turned the Israelites into slaves. Now, there's a lot of different types of slavery in the Bible. In some places, a slave was more of, a, of an indentured servant where you would sign up to work for someone for a period of you know, seven years or more in order to pay off your debts. And the relationship could be quite a healthy relationship. I guess it's not all that different from entering into a contract of work of employment today to be able to pay off your bills, you know. But as Dave Ramsey would say, you know, the lender, is, uh, uh, the borrower is a slave to the lender, right? So it would be kind of that way. However, this is not the case here with the Israelites who are exiled and living in Egypt. This was a brutal kind of slavery, the chattel type of slavery that we may have seen even in America, you know, 200 years ago, where they didn't have a choice. And the Egyptians were forcing the Israelites hard, 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 back-breaking labor. They were trying to break the spirit of the Israelites. But even through that, the Israelites continued to grow in number even as slaves. And they grew in numbers so much that the Pharaoh and the leaders of Egypt, they were really worried uh, that the Israelites were going to be able to outnumber the Egyptians. And if the Egyptians were to have to go to war, they were afraid that the Israelites would fight against them and that they would be defeated and overthrown in their own country. So everything was fine and dandy as long as the Israelites were in the minority. In fact, if you look over history, throughout history, when minorities start reaching a level of about 15 to 20% of population, the original inhabitants or the natives, they start trying to figure out a way to maintain control. We see this throughout all kinds of different cultures, and they get nervous when the minorities begin to start gaining more and more power. And so this is what's happening with Egypt during this time. And so the Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, decides to do something actually barbaric in order to try to keep control of the Israelites who were living in the land. And the Pharaoh introduces infanticide. Infanticide. He decides that he would have every newborn male baby killed by the midwives at the moment that they were born. That's what he decided to do. I mean, can you imagine that? That's unthinkable, right? I mean, it's hard to stomach a culture that would kill babies. The Pharaoh, I'll just let that sink in. The Pharaoh told his people to stay on the lookout for Hebrew babies. And if they saw one, they were to throw him in the Nile River and watch him drown. I mean, this is crazy. And it was during this, this reign of the terror that Yachved became pregnant with her third child. Now, she didn't have to worry about her older children, Aaron and Miriam, but the child in her womb would be fair game for any patriotic Egyptian who was in a bad mood. They literally could kill her son. Can you imagine living in such a fear? When I think about that culture and that time in which Jacobed was called to be a mother, 
I think of some moms today. I think of mothers who are some mothers in developing countries, even right now in the year 2023, who face the real, very real prospect of having their sons taken from their arms to be trained as child soldiers. And these are challenging days to be a mother even in our world today. Although, you know, the threat to have our babies killed or or stolen in America is pretty slim. There are, however, forces at work which threaten to drown our children. Kids might drown in the river of violence and promiscuity. It's just pouring out over our TV waves and over social media right now. And these devices that have made life so much easier for us has actually complicated things a whole lot more. Our kids can drown in a sea of confusion as the lines between right and wrong have become blurred in our society. They can, they can drown in competitive culture that rewards performance over character. Every conscientious parent knows how dangerous it is to grow up in our world. And in the dangerous world in which she found herself, Yachaved, I love saying that, it just sounds like a powerful name, Yachaved, stands out because she did what she could. She did everything she could to save her child. And then when she could do no more, she actually depended totally. She put her trust, and that's a scripture theme all throughout the Bible, is trust in God, trust in God, trust in God. And she had to put her complete trust, even with her child, in God. Some of you, some of you know what that's like. You have to just trust your child with God. You've done everything you can. Now you have to trust your child with God. But Yaakovid was a model of faith. Here's what it says in Exodus chapter 2. Now I'm going to go through the scripture in Exodus chapter 2, 1 through 10. And we're going to talk about this passage today. About this time, a man and woman, that was Amram and Yaakovid. We know that from genealogy. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. Now, I want to pause here on this because I think there might be a lesson that we could just easily skip over here if we're not careful. This is a powerful message for us too. Just this passage of scripture, they got married. During this time, the woman became pregnant during this time. Amram Amram and Yaakovid got married in this current culture and they decided to have a baby, even with the barbaric edict of the Pharaoh. And I think this is important for us to see this because I've seen this growing trend in our culture for people to think, oh, you don't want to get married in this culture. Divorce is so rampant in our culture. I don't think we should ever get married. I got burned before. I'm not going to get married again. Let's just live together. Now, I know you've had preachers and you've had your moms and your dads or your grandparents said, you know, living together is a sin. No, living together is not the sin. Living together is not the issue. I know plenty of people that are not living together that are still not living according to what God's standards are and what he wants for us. Purity, purity and being in a committed, covenant, holy relationship with your spouse is, spouse is the issue. That's the issue that God calls for us. And I've, heard, I've heard, heard some people say, well, we can't get married or it'll mess up our social security. Or some other reason along those lines. And I always say, I always say this, and just listen to me. Don't turn me off just yet. Uh, I always say, don't try and justify against doing what God commanded. I say, get married. Get married. Uh, And I don't care, you know, honestly, um, I don't really care if you're married or legally or not by the state. The government actually only got involved in marriages hundreds and thousands of years after marriages were established Uh, under the covenant of marriage between God. It was only in 1913 that the federal government formally recognized marriage uh, in law for the first time with the passage of the Revenue Act. And so they did that in order to be able to help uh, advocate for legal challenges, but also to gain tax money 
And that's why it was that. But for thousands of years before men and women were married under the government laws, they were married, they were married as a covenant, a holy covenant relationship between a man and a woman. So if you're living together and enjoying all the benefits of marriage that you've never made and you never made the commitment in a covenant before God, you should do that in accordance to God's laws. And I know there may be some people watching online because it wouldn't be anybody in here that think, you know, <laughs> wow, you're so old fashioned, Mitch. But this is one area that I'm proud to actually be old fashioned in because this was God's laws that were established in the very beginning. By the way, I have married people who want to make that covenant, but to keep it out of the state. And so come and talk to me about that if that's something that you want to do. But also, some people have said, well, I'm not going to raise a child in this culture today. I wouldn't want to bring a child into this confused current world that we live in. And, and, and so what has happened as a result is that we have lost ground on the beautiful covenant of marriage the way that God intended and we are having less children as a whole, as a nation. But God's design from the very beginning was for a man and for a woman to enter into a holy covenant relationship committed to each other with God as the sinner and to have children and to raise those children to know our Lord Jesus Christ and their purpose of living and to pour into the family unit and to grow in population as Jesus is the center of our homes. That's our purpose. That's our purpose. In fact, being in a covenant relationship and raising godly children is the only way to push back the confusion that is plaguing our society today with all the hoopla that we hear and see on the news day in and day out. It's the only way. All right. That was a little bit of a, just a rant from that one passage. <laughs> But, but I, felt like, I felt like I didn't want to skip over that. I, I really felt like there was something that we could learn from that. Um, and if that made some of you uncomfortable, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But here, I'm going to go on through. Let's get back to Yahweh, okay? But when she could no longer hide him, Moses, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister, that's Miriam, and again, we know that from the genealogy. The baby's sister, Miriam, then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy, Moses, was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She says, this must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Are you following this? <clears throat> yes, Pharaoh's daughter says. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, and I'll pay you for your help. We're going to talk about that. That's fun. That's just God right there. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. And the princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. This is an amazing story of faith here and God at work in a woman's life and in a family's life who put their trust, when all else was lost, put their trust in God. And Jacobed, Jacobed had a courageous faith. You see, though the king said all the male Hebrew babies had to be thrown into the Nile, Jacobed and her husband disobeyed the king and hid Moses for three months. That takes courage. Imagine how hard that that probably was to hide an infant. My daughter, Hannah, uh, when she was born, we didn't quite know what to do with her as young uh, parents. And I remember those first few months because she had a really bad case of colic. We could not have hidden that child <laughs> if we wanted to, you know. One of us had to be touching her at all times. I mean, we had to touch her in some way. We had to touch her to keep her from crying. We, we would go on vacation from Kentucky to Florida, 
and you know, 16 hour drive. And I'd be like, I'd have to reach around and just hold her foot the whole time we're driving. I'd just be like, Michelle, I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. And so then Michelle, we'd trade off. We drove to Florida like this the whole time coming down here. Somebody had to be touching that kid the whole time. She made way too much noise. But somehow, Yahweh succeeded in hiding Moses. And we often think of faith as as passive, and the whole idea of let go and let God, but real faith is an active thing, and faith sometimes calls us, causes us to do risky things. And I think about mothers who have been unable to conceive, but they have seen that as an opportunity to adopt children who might otherwise have spent their lives in an orphanage. That, that's a courageous act of faith. Most of you know I was adopted. And there's not too many days that go by that I don't thank God that my biological mother had the courage to have me and also realize uh, that she couldn't give me the kind of love and home that I needed to have. And so she made the gutsy and probably very hard decision to have someone else raise me. And I thank God every day for my mom who adopted me and raised me, and loved me, and taught me the values of living, my purpose for being, and she taught me about Jesus Christ. I think about mothers who are married, uh, and sometimes to unbelieving husbands, but yet they still want to expose their children to the, to, to the word of God, to the truth of, of the word of God. I think of mothers who stand up to teenage sons and daughters, sometimes saying no to something When they think, well, all the other mothers say yes, right? Sometimes you can't be your kid's best friend. You have to be the gutsy parent making the hard decisions. I think of mothers who have given up lucrative careers so that they can stay at home with their children and everyone else around them thinks that they're crazy. Michelle made some incredible sacrifices with her music career, actually, and other ambitions so that she could stay at home and raise our children. And what gives these mothers the courage to act in such a way is that they fear God, as Yaakov did. They fear God more than they fear man. They, they want to please God more than they want to please their friends or even their children. And they put their trust in God. And they trust that as they're obedient to what he has called them to do in the face of threatening circumstances, he, God, is going to take care of them and take care of their child. So Yaakov had a courageous faith. Yaakov also had a sensible faith. She had a sensible faith. After three months of hiding her baby, she now sees the handwriting on the wall. And so she makes a little wicker basket, covers it with tar and pitch to make it float, and puts it in the reeds on the banks of the Nile. Now, it's interesting that the word used for basket here is the same used for Noah's Ark. That's interesting to me. Noah's ark was covered with tar and pitch just like this one. And both Noah's ark and Moses' ark um, is not a very safe environment because the occupants are at the mercy of the elements, right? And so the Nile was known for crocodiles, right? The Nile's known for crocodiles, different from American alligators, American alligators are usually pretty docile. You don't have to worry if you're in the Mayaka. You don't have to worry too much. Too much, you know. But a crocodile in the Nile, let me tell you, those things are fierce. And at three months old, Moses was completely helpless in a river filled with crocodiles. But I want you to notice that Yaakov was not careless about this. She was sensible. She didn't just send him floating down the river. She placed him among the reeds, among the banks of the Nile, which was a place where the women would have congregated and where they would have gathered for their water. It would have sort of been, this is not a good analogy, but it would sort of been like placing a baby on the steps of a hospital today. So she didn't just uh, put him in the Nile and wave goodbye and say, okay, see you, Moses, have a nice life. Maybe I'll see you sometime. But she also had Moses' older sister, Miriam, to stand at a distance to find out, you know, what's going on. Let's keep an eye on him. And if Yaakov herself had been standing by the reeds, watching and waiting, it would have been obvious that who she was. But Moses' sister, younger girl, made a good spy. 
And so when Moses was discovered in the Nile, his sister comes and offers to find a Hebrew woman to nurse him. And then you can see God's plan is starting to fall in place. And you see, Yaakov was clever. She was sensible in her planning. Yaakov courageous, sensible faith is now being rewarded. Her courageous, sensible faith is rewarded by God. And that's the way that God operates in our life. When you're faithful to God, he is going to reward you. And as Moses floated along the banks of the Nile, the daughter of the Pharaoh himself arrives with her maidens. And the text that you read says that she saw the basket and brought it to her. She opened it and sees the child crying inside. And she has pity on him because he was a Hebrew and could have just as well have been dead. And it was standard procedure uh, during that time for a wealthy woman to hire a wet nurse to feed a child until it was weaned. And the wet nurse would be the legal guardian during those first years. And so at just the right time, Moses' sister moves in and makes an offer to help fulfill that custom. So then she went to find Yaakov, who not only got to raise Moses now, but now she's being paid for it. She's being paid to raise her own son. Wouldn't that be awesome? How much would it take? How much would it be worth for you husbands to pay your wives and they raise their children? You couldn't afford that, you know. You couldn't afford that. She got paid to raise her own children. Can you just see? This is God. We see this kind of God all throughout Scripture. This is God. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, God had his hand all over Moses' life and Yaakov's life all along. And the mother did what she could, but she couldn't have done it all on her own. She had to put her trust. She had to put her trust in God. And what was interesting, too, is Pharaoh's chosen instrument of death was the Nile River became the instrument through which Moses was saved. And his mother even followed Pharaoh's orders in putting him in the river, right? And a member of Pharaoh's own family comes to the river at just the right time and rescues the future deliverer Moses. And somehow or another, he knew just when the right time was to cry. And the baby was reunited with his mother, who was then able to raise the child to know during these formidable years, formative years, he was able to raise the child to know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then Yaakov released him to Pharaoh's daughter after he was weaned and after he had some of these formidable years and knowing who God was. But then, listen to this. I know it's a lot of history today, a little different. But Moses spent his whole youth in Pharaoh's court where he learned about law. He, he learned about rhetoric. He, he learned how to debate he, he learned about mathematics. He even learned about hieroglyphics. He even learned about the art of war. And we can see that in Acts chapter 7 as we jump back into that even next week. And then because Moses learned all these things, he put all the things that he learned into practice. And Moses then led later on 2 million people through the desert, putting all of his disciplines that he had learned in Pharaoh's court to work. All that happened. All that happened because Yahweh did had the faith and the courage to allow God to take the lead in her life when she had nowhere else to turn. And I just want to say, and maybe you're like that. Maybe you feel like, I don't know where else to turn, so I'm just going to have to put my entire faith and trust in God. That's what godly parents do. Someone uh, turned, I love this quote, really doesn't have anything to do with the message, but I thought, I got to work this in somewhere because I thought it was really powerful. Someone uh, once turned to a full-time mom and said, and what is it that you do, my dear? And she responded, I am socializing two homeo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God willed from the beginning of creation. What do you do? And so, mothers and fathers, your ultimate purpose is to foster a courageous, sensible faith that will instill in your children a knowledge of and a faith in and a love for our God. 
who sees and knows your child's deepest needs for salvation and has decisively moved to accomplish it through the work of Jesus Christ. But don't worry, it's not all up to you. God is partnering with you. It's a huge responsibility. And God had a very special purpose for Moses. And let me say this, moms and dads, God has a special purpose for your unique and your beautiful, fine specimen of a child. Someone asked me what has been one of the biggest surprises of my life. And I will tell you, the level of parenting that we have had to do after our kids have left home. I just thought when they reached 18, I was done, you know? And uh, nobody told me that. And, and I know we have a lot of um, parents who have grown children like I do. And we have a lot of grandparents here. I have two kids and five grandchildren. We started when I was 12, you know? <laughs> but let me say, as long as you are alive, as long as you're alive and as long as your children are alive, it is never too late for your faith to have an impact, a positive impact on your children. There are many times, even as a pastor, I feel like I tried to protect my children. I tried to protect my children from the church sometimes. You've heard, those of you who maybe have grown up in the church, you've heard about preacher's kids and all that. I tried to protect my children from that so much that I don't know that I always did the best job in really discipling my kids. And it's one thing if I could go back and do something different again, I would have done that, but I can't. So what I want to do now is I'm having conversations that I should have had when they were younger. And so it's never, ever too late. As long as you're still breathing and as long as they're breathing, it's not too late to, have, to allow your faith to have a positive impact on your children. And for those of you who are grandparents, listen, don't underestimate the influence that you can have on your grandchildren in teaching and exposing them to the truth of God's word. And for those of you without children, you can have a profound impact in the lives of children and your sphere of influence. Even the kids, even this, our students, our young men and women who are going to be having an impact in the lives of children. You, every single one of us can have an impact in the lives of children. And we can have that even right here in our churches. The number of children, our, our, kids, our kids' numbers have tripled this year. You know? And there are... Yeah, it's been great. You just wait for a year from now. It's going to be crazy. Um, I mean, let me say this also, and then I'll, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, there are moms, even in our own church, that are trying to do this whole thing on their own. And they could use your support. And they could use your mentoring. This is a biblical thing. I and mean, we see this throughout Scripture where older people poured into the lives of those who are younger. And so maybe, you're, maybe you never had kids. Maybe your kids are grown. I don't know what the relationship, but I know that there are moms in our very own church right here that are trying to do this thing on their own. And they need a mentor. They need a mentor around them. We have dads. We have young dads who need those of you who have experience, you know. And I know experience is a comb that life gives you after you lose your hair think about that so if you're like me and you've lost your hair you know listen to the bald man be the bald man go pour into the lives of those they need mentors they need mentors i'm looking at dan hindy he started a whole ministry uh, elder strong and 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 it's about mentoring other people. He has a whole ministry about that. It's just amazing. That should be something that we desire as a church, especially a church where we have so much experience and so much wisdom. You know, we need to pour into those. All right, I'm done. Let's, uh, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> let's stand and let's pray together today. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the way that you modeled and celebrated and honored women throughout scripture and that you used them in powerful and mighty ways to usher your kingdom in. And 
And we want to be that kind of church too, God. And we thank you for the faith of Yaakov. We thank you for Moses and how he led his people. We thank you for Jesus.